wow. I, uh, I have no other words, if I'm honest. Um, I've just got off in, in a good, an unbelievable long chat with Kyle. Kyle Hollingsworth and her journey is unbelievable. I really believe we probably could make a movie out of this one. I really, really do. Um, she's an illustrator. Um, as you can see in this picture, we will talk about, she's from Friends, by the way. Pretty cool. But it's not about it's not about that. It's about the journey that and the recovery process that Kyle has been on in the journey since she was eight years old. Finding a mother to suicide. She goes through way, I don't even know if I can say this, but all the darkness that just will blow your mind. From drugs, not her, but other people in her life. Drugs, kidnapping, death. Dealing, sexual assault, rape, <laughs> toxic relationships, narcissism. Yet, she's leading her own beautiful way in, in an incredible way too. I, I don't want to ruin it. I just You've got to listen to this. You, you, you won't want to turn it off, I promise you. It's unreal. Um, so I'm going to let you meet Kyle, this beautiful person who I'm going to be friends with. She has no choice, <laughs> but she's insane. She's just amazing, uh, insane in a good way. But come back for Kyle. Um, if you're not already subscribing, please, please subscribe and follow the show on any, any platforms that you can. And um, I really appreciate you tuning in. But Kyle is beautiful, absolutely amazing person. And I can't speak more highly about her. Um, we'll be back right after the, uh, the intro. Welcome to Leading Our Own Way. I'm your host, Andrew White, and this is the podcast that unveils captivating narratives of resilience and personal triumph. This podcast is for anyone seeking inspiration and insights on overcoming life's challenges. Follow and subscribe, and then we can lead together forever. Good morning, Kyle. Welcome to Leading Our Own Way. How are you today? I'm so good. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Oh, no, thank you for joining me. Uh, it's such a pleasure to have you. And well, I say good morning, but it's actually good afternoon to you. Uh, in New You're in New Mexico. Is that correct? Is that right? That's New right. Mexico? Yeah, it's yeah. almost 5 p.m. here. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've had to navigate the times pretty well to get this right, haven't we? <laughs> yeah, it's been a little bit of a journey. <laughs> Six, I think, what, you're 16 hours behind me, I think you are? Yes, uh, yes. I, I won't it's... tell you what's going to happen. What? I will... <laughs> <laughs> Just a joke. It's a time travel joke. I, I won't oh, tell you what's going to uh, happen. <laughs> dad, oh, dad joke. Yeah, probably uh, better if I don't know, honestly. <laughs> um, yes, thank you for joining me on my journey. I, I really appreciate it. Um, I, As you know, I've been interviewing people who have been on a journey, and I know we're going to get real deep into yours. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself, Kyle, and, and how, uh, how you lead in your own way. Oh my goodness. Oh, where do I start? Um, I've been through a huge transformation in the last year and a half. I was living in Los Angeles and I just reached my point where I had to leave. I had to leave the city and my husband and I uprooted and just completely walked away from our life there and started over in New Mexico. And that was sort of a cap on the last 11 years that I've been doing a ton of work on my own journey, my own healing. Mm -hmm. And so currently I... Gosh, I'm an artist. I'm a visual artist, first and foremost, have been since I was a child. Art is a beautiful part of my life and, and really important to me. And I also illustrate, I, I draw, I do children's books. Um, I have so many different interests, but like right now in my life, I can say for the first time ever, to list them all is to list my favorite things. So oh. the art is there, the music is there. I'm a singer songwriter. I do sound healing. I'm a Reiki practitioner um, and I do graphic design and the fine art as well. And so it's just a really, it's a, it's a juicy time for me. And a great deal of my energy is also focused on helping to be a lighthouse for other people. Um, I'm currently hosting my own podcast and uh, I have a private Facebook group and all of that oh. is just in service of helping other people to see what's possible. Beautiful. Uh, yeah. Well, on that topic of your Facebook group, I, for anyone who is interested, I'm going to show a picture of what it looks like. Uh, yeah. I joined it. 
And that's um, the art for the group and for the podcast, actually. They're oh, both yes. the same name. Yeah, yeah. So courageous as fuck. Is that what it's called? That's what it says. And uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. What's the uh, you've got the, you've got the confidence to call it that? Um, what is what? Why courageous as fuck? I will tell you exactly. Um, so about three years ago, so during COVID, I, I had a corporate job, um, just had this, you know, but just bought a new house and done all these things. And life mm. seemed like I had it planned out really well. And we know what happens when we think that all hell broke loose. COVID, I had a devastating injury. We lost friends. We lost animals. Just a lot going on. I lost the job. Um, and I was absolutely struggling to figure out how to continue my life and, and what direction to go in. And so I had joined this coaching group and I was in a group with about 14, 12 to 14 other women. And I was, I felt like I was getting nowhere and I was really frustrated and I got really emotional on a call one night and I was kind of tearing up. And I remember <clears throat> the coach saying to me, well, cause I kept saying, well, I don't know this and I don't know this and I don't, I just, I'm so confused. And she said, well, what do you know? for sure right now. And I said, Oh, I can tell you what I know. I know I'm courageous as fuck. And the whole room went quiet. And everybody was like, you know, that's it, right? And I was like, Yeah, I think I do. I think that's it. And so I had had this Facebook group, the same group, and it was called Creative with Kyle. And I just would come on and tell stories, not the deep, heavy stuff, but like, just lighthearted stories whilst painting and drawing. And I would, you know, film that and that would be the group. And I think I had about 60 members. It was not it was just a small little thing. And I changed the name to Courageous AF, and now I have over 660 or so members. Wow. For some reason, that just shifted everything. Taking the conversation away from let's paint and talk about meaningless shit to let's go deep and talk about real stuff. And let's yeah. create a container where we can express and normalize conversations around some of life's biggest challenges. And I am the perfect person to do that because I've survived some of them. Yeah. A lot and of I them. Know, <laughs> and I know, well, clearly, yeah. And, and I know we're going to get deep into all of those yeah. things. And, and uh, first of all, I appreciate you being vulnerable today. Um, yeah, and course. I know you are vulnerable quite a lot and it's probably quite easy for you to maybe, I don't know, I could be wrong but the, you what with that group you've created what you've clearly done there people have responded and wanted a safe space to be able to one here but also to to maybe talk about their shit right yeah absolutely yes yeah that's amazing yeah um it's powerful when you when people can see those those words and and, and be more responsive to as fuck as well as courageous but as fuck right i don't yeah. know yeah, yeah i mean i think it's a, i think it's a it's a sort of a Gosh, what's the word I'm trying to think of? Kind of like a war cry. I just was like, I can't be soft anymore. I had mm. been kind of approaching the way I showed up uh, very gingerly and very carefully and trying to make sure it fit, you know, into what would be acceptable. And this was, this is a big thing that I've worked on through my life. And I finally was just like, I'm done. I don't care. The yeah. right people will find me. And that's why I do it. You know, it's, it's, and it's been wonderful. It's been, it's been very freeing. <laughs> Yeah. And you know, I, 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 I connect with you on that pretty well because with this, with this podcast in the grand scheme of things, it's pretty new. It's pretty raw and I'm a rookie, uh, but that's how I feel about the podcast. You know, some, some people, my partner says, you know, your episodes are too long. People are going, Oh, I, I don't care. The right people will find it uh, and, and yeah. sit with it and, and will sit there because they need it. And that's okay. Um, yeah. I'm totally fine with it. Even if it's in a year's time, people will find it. The right people will find it and people will sit because they need it or they want it. End of story. So I'm okay with that, to be honest. So yeah, I can see, yeah, I totally get it. With, um, it's weird because if you had a community group like that, called that in an actual physical building and not online, do you think the same people would show up? Would that, do you know mm. what I mean? Like, because that physical presence and that one stepping into the shoes and putting the pants on that day to go down to that center, do you think that'd be harder or I, I don't know? Do you know I, what I mean? Do you know where I'm coming from? I do. That's an interesting question. And the first thing I think of is that inside of my group, so let's say I've got, I, I don't remember the exact number right now, but it's around 660 or so. Mm. Let's say there's about 40 to 50 people who are very active in the group, who comment on things, who share vulnerably, and a lot of the rest hang back. And, just, yeah. and for a while, I was like, am I screaming into the void? Like, or is, this, is there any value here for people? But then after time, I realized that a lot of them are getting a lot of value out of it. Because some of them have messaged me privately, but they're just like, I'm just too shy to, you know, speak yeah. up. Yeah. And so for them, their, their choice is to kind of remain 
in the background and just observe and take in information that way. And so I think that's really cool and a good opportunity. And if it wasn't in, in a physical space, I think maybe different people would come. I would, yeah. I would like to think that I would create such a welcoming and safe container that everyone would, would be welcome. But yeah. I mean, you know, who knows? <laughs> yeah. There's an, there's an, yeah. I, again, I connect with that. I feel like not many people reach out with this podcast, uh, but yet somebody then does and goes, I've watched all the episodes. I have no yeah. idea who they are. They've, they're anonymous and they go, I've watched every single episode. It's been powerful. And I'm like, that's why I'm doing it. Exactly. Exactly. You sit back and go, no one's seeing it. No one's watching. Ah, and mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And then somebody pops out of the blue, just when you're feeling quite low and, and you go, oh, you just get that, um, oxytocin release. And I'm like, oh, that's mm -hmm. why I'm doing it. That, you know what I mean? That love and that trust and yeah, love it. Absolutely. It keeps me going when I, yeah, cause the podcast that I'm doing is my life story and some days it's hard. And yeah. other days I'm like, oh, does anybody even care about this? You know, but then I'll get an email yeah, or I'll get a message on Instagram or, and someone saying to me, oh my God, I heard myself in you today. And I'm so grateful that you can talk about this and thank you. And, you know, from all different, um, people, all different, some people I've never met before. And some people I know who are just like, oh my God, I'm so proud of you. I'm so grateful. Cause I don't know how to talk about this. Yeah. So it's, it's, yeah. it keeps us going and that's why we're doing it. Exactly. I'm not doing it for me. I'm not, I don't regurgitating stuff and talking, sharing stories for my benefit. I know the story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I thought I was doing this as that as part of my therapeutic response, recovery and whatnot for my own stuff, but I'm not because I bought the domain and got all the stuff over a year ago. I looked at the receipts not long ago and it was like March last year. And I didn't launch this till April this year. So I think I look back and go, I just wasn't ready to build it. I wasn't ready to get it out there until I was set. And my, you know what I mean? Does that make I sense? Did. Yeah, absolutely. I to, yeah. Um, so this was about helping just one person um, connect with the with the guest that I'm interviewing. Yeah. Anyway, this is about you. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm fascinated with your journey. I know and we'll, we'll come back to all these amazing things of how you're leading your own way, because I've got a picture of you with your co-author of one of your books. Uh, you just showed me about one of your other books with foods. I'm fascinated about that. Mm. Uh, and we'll get into why you went down that road. Okay. Um, but let's talk, let's talk about your journey a little bit of why and what let's get into the root cause of what you're doing to lead in your own way. You know, um, oh, I've got, wow. I've, let's, let's go there. If you're happy to go down that road, Kyle. Absolutely. Um, and I will, I will start with exactly how my podcast begins because Beautiful. my journey when I was eight years old really began, well, I'm going to call it my trauma journey. My, my pain journey began when I was eight years old and I released my podcast on Valentine's day because this event happened on Valentine's day. Um, and it began a really insane story that lasted for decades. But the, this beginning event was my mother's suicide when I was eight and my sister was 10 and we lived alone with her. She took her life the night of Valentine's day. And the next morning we woke up to a very quiet house with very strange energy and did not know what was happening. I remember getting out of bed and I was going to go watch cartoons because at that point cartoons only happened on Saturdays and it was this delicious treat, you know, cereal and cartoons. And I jumped out of bed and I noticed that mama, what's what I called her, was not in her bed. Hmm. And I thought that was strange. And so I looked around and I didn't see her anywhere. And there was a bathroom in the hallway that my sister and I shared and that door was locked and the light was on. And I got it in my little head we did that there was someone in there hurting her or keeping her from calling out to us or something of that nature. And it was, it was a very scary little while. I would say it was probably about half an hour of us trying to figure out what was happening and knocking on the door. I remember I was eight years old and I went and got a knife and I was walking around the house looking for the bad guy, you know, and trying to figure it out. And my mother's boyfriend at the time suddenly burst into the front door and came down the hall and kicked open the bathroom door and she was lying there in the tub and I did not know it at the time, but she had died. Why did, um, the pie, the boyfriend burst through the door? Did he sense something or 
I, I don't know because I never got the chance to ask him. I was a child and he honestly vanished after her death. But I know that they had been going through some struggles. I know that my mother dealt with mental health issues. I know that she dealt with depression. I know that she was abused when she was younger. So there was a lot going on there and she'd made other half-hearted attempts. And part of me isn't sure exactly that this was intentional fully. Um, mm. Because it was Valentine's night, I always wondered about whether he was going to, excuse me, <clears throat> whether he was meant to come earlier or the night before. Yeah. There's a lot of mystery surrounding it, and that mystery only got solved in recent years, believe it or not. So, wow. yeah. <laughs> how, how, um, how did it get resolved only years ago then? Can, can you give me some Clarification on that. Clarity Absolutely. on that, sorry. Yeah. So what I noticed when that morning that I came out of my bedroom is I looked, I, again, I think you and I talked about this offline, but I'm a very visual person and I, I take in everything around me. It's just a characteristic of my particular brain. And I remember my eyes scanning her room and I saw a little pill bottle laying off to the side on her dresser with the cap off of it. I really didn't know what prescriptions were, but I just recognized it as something I'd seen her have before. And so for many, many years, I assumed, because no one would tell me, <laughs> that she had taken this bottle of pills. And she had written a suicide note, just so I'm clear, um, to myself and my sister. And it was, it was just basically who to call and that she was deeply sorry and she didn't feel like she was a very good mama. And so I just put all of that into a package and decided that's exactly what had happened. And what I've discovered through my own healing journey and talking with family it, it, doing lots of different conversations and investigations is that it's not as simple as all that. So about 20 years ago, gosh, that's right. About 20 years ago, I had a, an uncle, my mother's brother, tell me that that's not how she died. And oh, it was a very striking conversation. I had had my own child and he was quite young and I was just like, wait, what? And he, he showed me some documentation and he was like, yeah, we're not really sure what happened. There wasn't anything in her system. And he gave me this whole story that completely just derailed me because I had made peace with this event and made peace with her death based on the facts that I thought that I knew. And so he kind of turned all that over. Like it felt like somebody just pulling a, a tablecloth off a table. And mm. then I sat in such confusion for years. I could not understand exactly what happened, why no one had found out. Why This was 1975, just so we understand. They didn't do toxicology. They didn't do any sort of, you know, they just didn't have the forensics that they do now. So basically they just said, this is what it is. It's written as a, a suicide. You know, she had pulmonary edema. Anyway, over the last several years, I've had very key players in this story who've passed away, starting with my mother's mother and ending with my mother's sister. And prior to their death, I had conversations with them where actually documents were produced to me for the first time in all these years that showed that they knew exactly how she died, that my uncle had known exactly how she died. I don't know why he lied to me. I don't know why he falsified this whole story. She did die from taking the medication. She did die from taking pills, and there were some other contents in her stomach. But there's a lot of mystery around the why and the timing. <clears throat> some of it's not completely solved at this point. And I'll, I'll throw a really weird wrench into the conversation and tell you that I actually had a reading from a very um, established medium a few months ago. And... For the first time ever with someone in that work, my mother came through and it was very, the information she gave me was absolutely verifiable. And there was wow. talk of something that I've always suspected is that there's something more, there was something more to her dying that night, that it wasn't as simple as she crawled into bed or crawled into the bathtub and took a bottle of pills. So yeah, um, <clears throat> it's, I also have some intuitive gifts and I, I've always felt as though that the story is a lot more complicated than it was presented or even in the final days that it was like flipped back and flipped back. And then finally it was like, okay, this is how she died. I read this letter that my uncle had written saying that here, we found out exactly what caused it. Here's this, here's this, here's this, and just stating it all. And so at that point I was just like, okay, I'm not going to have conversations with my family anymore because I'm not getting, I'm not what getting clarity. I'm not getting honest answers. And so Quite frankly, I've spent the last six months or so doing a lot of just internal work and a lot of trying to connect with her and a lot of just listening to my own 
inner guidance to get clear about what happened. And I think that what I've had to do is make peace with the fact that we're never going to understand completely mm. the, the, the goings on of that evening and the goings on of the days prior and certainly the days after, because it was, we were quite young and we were told nothing and everything happened so fast. Yeah. Hmm. I am. Um, I have to ask and you don't have to answer if it's inappropriate, but, um, it's if everyone's thinking what I'm thinking, um, I'm very curious to, and if you're comfortable, what, what did your mum say to you? What, what, what did she say in the, when you, when she came through? Oh gosh. Um, well, there's been a couple of times, uh, and as you ask it, I'm, I feel really called to share both if that's okay. Yeah. My mom came through to me individually Okay, gosh, how do I how do I make this make all sense? So about four years ago, I had a devastating injury. Right a month before COVID hit, I had um, uh, my dog attacked me, and he tore off part of my upper lip. I've got a, a scar that's probably hard to see wow. on camera, but it's there. And in the wake of that, I was honestly deeply depressed. I was deeply triggered. I went into a very dark depression and it felt suicidal. I just, it was really an intense time because it kind of just reignited a lot of the trauma that I had been through. And so my friend took me to a hot spring in Ojai, Ojai, California. And this was a beautiful place. And we were there at midnight and we were laying in this hot water. I was by myself. I asked to be alone. And I was looking at this giant boulder sitting across from me and the moon was full. It was just gorgeous. And all of a sudden the dog who had attacked me, who we'd put down, um, we had to, it's a long story. Um, yeah, I was going to ask you, yeah. he was, he was injured and he was in mental decline and he had attacked me more than once and it was only going to get worse. And we just couldn't, we couldn't yeah. bear the idea of medicating him to keep him around. He, what was, breed? he, was, he was old. He was Boston Terrier and he was 15. So and did you we, have him since he was a pup? No, my husband had him when we met and uh -huh. he'd had him for quite a while. So it was a very, it was a very devastating loss. Anyway, I'm looking at this boulder and I'm completely sober. Just so I'm clear, I'm just sitting in this hot spring and I just see my dog hop up onto the rock and tell me that he's good. He'll be back. He's going to be a small, but little bit bigger white dog with Brown, but he's also going to have some black and just very, very specific information. And I was like, okay cool. And then it was as if he just hopped away and my mom came and sat. And it was one of the most profound experiences of my life because she was, she was there. I could feel her and see her. And I was asking her, the first thing I said to her was, why did this happen to me? Yeah. And she said, so you can see how beautiful you are. Oh my word. And I asked her, about my intuitive gifts because I've been having some big experiences for a long time. And, and I said, did you have this too? And she said, yeah. And I said, is this part of why you left? And she said it had something to do with it. And so that in that moment, it kind of confused me more. So, but it was so wonderful to interact with her. And I felt so complete after that. And I asked her if she would help me. And she said, I will, I can, you don't need me, but I can. And I have definitely felt her presence much more strongly since then. Now, understanding that prior to that for decades, I could, I did not feel like I could feel her ever. Yeah. And that was really heartbreaking for me because I had felt the presence of other um, people who had passed. So the next time she showed up was quite recently, a few months ago when I had this reading with this medium and she came through and she was giving me this very specific information. And one of the things that she said was, I'm mad as hell about what happened when I died to you. And I'm very sorry because when she died, our family behaved really badly. And my sister and I were taken in the night and taken out of state by relatives. And it was as good as a kidnapping. And there was the police ended up getting involved. It was very weird. And so through this communication with the medium, she basically imparted to me that that was not her wish. It was not her desire. She was very uh, not okay with it and everything that happened. And just, there was a lot of apologizing for specific things. And, and so after that, I just felt like, okay, I've got as much information as I'm ever going to have. And it's still incomplete and I'm going to have to make peace with that. Yeah. So it's, it's a, it's, I have some, you know, I've had to process a lot of anger and disappointment around that but also make peace with it, you know? 
Yeah. Did did she give you any specific information regarding the death of her, of her? She did not. She said she did not necessarily mean to die that night. I think she she didn't give enough specificity for me to you know tease it out and make it a full picture. Hmm. But for me, what it did was confirm some of my own feelings that I've had for a very long time. I had feelings for many, many years that there was something not right about the way it all went down, that it wasn't yeah. as simple as it was presented or even as simple as it looked. And so I just felt like getting that communication for her from her kind of, I don't know, it, it, it oddly gave me closure, even though I didn't get all the details. Um, and I do think that, boy, I wish I could go back and find out some information and find some people and have conversations and tie it all together. But, and they've all passed. Yeah. And so at this point, the only way to communicate would be with spirit. And, and I have to live in the living world. And so in this world, I, I'm okay and I'm at peace about it. it, it yeah. it's, it's one of the many things in my life that I decided a few years ago to just choose. They just so had you can to, do, right? Yeah, it's a, it, you can love what is, you can choose what is, or you can spend your life fighting it. And I tried that, hmm. and it didn't work yeah. very well for me. You know, you're picking the right path for sure, but obviously depicting it, talking about it now is what, what's fascinating. Do you do you think there's somebody, and obviously we don't need to go down the depth of this, but do you think there's somebody that might be responsible as well as her taking the meds? I am she... curious. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, Sorry. yeah, no. I mean, I was, I was going to just elaborate, I suppose, but yeah, you're going to answer mm. it. But yeah, I mean, she said to you, didn't she? She didn't necessarily mean to die that day. So, do you think there was a, a contribution to it as well uh, uh, that maybe still be around or has passed since? I do think those the two people that I have in mind as you ask me that question have since passed, as yeah. far as I understand. Um, I say that because one of them is my father and the other is her boyfriend who vanished. I looked for him for 15 years and wow. he would be fairly old at this point. And so I, I've, again, I've had to let that go. I do have some suspicion about my father and about this gentleman. And I can say more about that. It's just my father and mother were divorced at this point, hence her having a boyfriend and us being alone. And my father had kind of stalked my mother for a while and had made her life miserable and had caused her a lot of pain. And I would not be surprised to discover that he had some sort of influence, whether it was just through what he said to her or something else. So yeah. I, I do feel uh, it wouldn't surprise me in the least given my father's character and her boyfriend, sh they had been in arguments, they'd had fights and things were very tumultuous leading up to her death and it was Valentine's Day. And so I can't but think that there had to be something that triggered it to, for her to make that choice on that night or for her to be in that situation and to die on that night. So it's, you know, I have to say I'm completely fascinated with true crime and it's probably because there's been so much in my family. And yeah. I would, this is a mystery I would love to completely solve. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So... <clears throat> The letter, though, it was. I want to come to the kidnapping in a second, but with the um, with the the letter, um, I'm just tr trying to fill in a big picture here. Was it her writing? That's really funny that you should ask. Um Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.